Hey, it's Jeremy from Jeremy.net. I'm a comic book artist, writer, creator, self-publisher, and I share my creative process here with you on the internet. If you would like to support this channel, get additional bonus live streams once a month, see my comic book artwork before anyone else, you can support and subscribe to this channel at patreon.com slash Jeremy. Patreon.com slash G-E-R-I-M-I. -I. That'll take you to my Patreon account. And if you would like to see the best of my social media posts delivered straight to your inbox, my, uh, my work in progress gifts, little thoughts I have about the creative process, all delivered to your inbox, along with a few extra comic book pages each month, you can go to newsletter.jeremy.net. They'll sign you up for my monthly newsletter. And if you'd like to purchase physical copies of my comics, or if you read digitally on Comixology or Kindle, you can go to amazon.jeremy.net. They'll forward you to my Amazon author page where you can pick up books like my first graphic novel, I Have the Gods. It is a psychological thriller about a man cursed with visions he cannot control. Or you can pick up volume one of my comic book, Morningstar. Morningstar is the story of Lucifer's fall from heaven, told as a Western. This book contains volume one, since issues one through four of an eight-issue series. Get all of that at amazon.jeremy.net. Okay, so this morning my setup is a little bit wonky because I, <sighs> I've been trying to fix the, the issues with my camera's autofocus, which has been a little off and on again. And I have a, get these books out of the way here. Oh, I've got an older camera that doesn't seem to have those issues However, it doesn't have built-in software or a driver that allows me to zoom in. So, you know, hence me showing you this with the camera really close to the board. It's this little guy right here. Close to the drawing board, but giving you a kind of a wide fisheye angle. So apologies for that. And uh, let's see. We've got William in the chat. Hey, William, how you doing? Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, today I am working on, or I'm continuing to work on a Doctor Strange piece. So... I drew the uh, the layouts based on my rough pencils digitally, and then I printed out in blue line on Bristol. So if I bring this close to the uh, the camera, you can kind of see Doctor Strange is there. It's an homage to the um, the cover or the pinup artwork that's on the first Doctor Strange Marvel Masterworks. So I'm using I'm inking with brushes. I'm breaking in my uh, my Windsor Newton Series Seven Number Two. It's my first time working with these, or with this brush. I've got a, a, a size two, a size four, and a size zero. Usually the twos and the zeros are my, uh, my weapons of choice. So I'm just gonna get in here and uh, move my phone out of the way so I don't get any water on it. Ah, he said, how did I learn to draw the way I do? William asks in the chat. <clears throat> well, William, I will tell you that the biggest thing that has helped me learn to draw, and it's not a matter of my style or, or working with a particular tool in terms of like working with ink, working with brush versus dip pen. Basically, I learned by going to figure drawing classes. Um... There's an instructor in, uh, in L.A. Um, named Carl Ganas. He teaches at the Animation Guild. I mean, he teaches everywhere. He teaches, actually, Walt Disney Studios. We'll have him come over. Disney, DreamWorks, a variety of the large animation studios in L.A. Um, usually, they have classes for their animators and their, their visual development artists. And he's one of the instructors who comes in and, uh, and teaches regularly at a lot of the studios in L.A. Um, I've been taking classes with him at the Animation Guild for probably over a decade now. And during the, uh, the quarantine, he started teaching classes online. So you can check him out. I believe his website is figuredrawingschool.com. But for me, learning has just been taking classes for a number of years. I've been studying. <clears throat> I went to a four-year university for fine art. And in the time that I was there, it taught me a lot about creativity, coming up with ideas and concepts. But 
it was a program that was probably geared more towards the fine art world and uh, fine art galleries. So they didn't really necessarily have a lot of emph emphasis on traditional academic drawing, which is, you know, learning how to draw the human figure, um, drawing from sculpts, drawing from the model. That was not the emphasis of that program. And so consequently, I think I came out of college more creative, but I came out a worse draftsman in terms of my actual drawing skills. And I don't think my skills really started to turn around until towards the end of that program when I started taking animation classes. And that's when I realized, oh wait, animators need to know how to really draw because they have to be able to revolve things in space, draw things, people, figures, all kinds of objects in different positions. Very similar to what you would need as a comic book artist. Um, I see Bobbles in the chat. Thank you for showing up, um, dropping in here. Um, I was just answering uh, William's question about how I learned to draw. And I continue to take figure drawing classes to this day. So I'm in my 40s. I graduated college quite a long time ago. And I would say probably about more than 10 years ago, probably around 12 years ago, I realized that I had been an artist for calling myself an artist for a long time, but I really didn't know how to draw very well. And that's when I dedicated myself to taking figure drawing classes regularly. And here's the uh, the trick is that I don't treat it like a skill that I'm trying to learn. And once I, I you know, once I've learned how to draw, um, I'm done. I treat it like a like lifting weights. It is a muscle that I constantly need to exercise. And the more I work at it, the better I get at figure drawing. The less I work out, the worse I get. If I end up going a few weeks without drawing or specifically studying the figure, I notice that when I do come back or when I draw, things are a little bit wonkier. My sense of anatomy is a little bit off. <clears throat> so the way that I learned to draw was by going to class once a week for three hours, sitting, working in front of a live model, taking various poses, and doing that consistently for over a decade. And I do believe that having a good instructor is very, very important. I think if you have anatomy books, you can find places that will have figure drawing workshops in your town where you can still learn. And you know, if you've got good books and you know what you're trying to, to get out of it, you can learn without an instructor, but you'll learn much slower than you will if you've got a, a decent instructor who can give you an understanding of the fundamentals in terms of like gesture, proportion, um, understanding volumes, understanding the figure as a three-dimensional object, how to turn the figure in space, the fundamentals and basics of anatomy. And when I say the basics of anatomy, that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to memorize every muscle group. <clears throat> um, it doesn't need, mean you need to memorize every bone in the body. Or rather, it doesn't mean you need to memorize every muscle. What I meant to say was you don't necessarily need, need to memorize every muscle, but you do need to understand the different muscle groups, the, the pecs, the muscles, the chest. You can understand the quadriceps in general without necessarily understanding every single muscle in it. Same with the hamstrings. But I mean, it, even with that, with just understanding the major muscle groups of the figure, it still takes a lot of time. And I think that that is an answer that can be a bummer to some people when they think, oh, wow, it's going to take a, uh, a long time to, uh, to learn, or they don't necessarily want to spend that much time. But something very interesting happened after about the first year or two of figure drawing. And even that's a long time. But <clears throat> I was taking figure drawing classes as a means to an end. I wanted to be a better comic book artist. Um, I wanted to be a better illustrator and I couldn't draw well enough to draw the things in my comics that I wanted to. But what I found over time was that I genuinely started to enjoy studying the human figure and drawing from, from, uh, from models in class. And I got to the point where now, honestly, as much as I love making comics, if for some reason I wasn't doing that at all, I would still want to draw from the model. I would still want to go to figure drawing classes. I would still want to um, continue doing life drawing and studying anatomy. 
I sort of fell in love with the process of learning how to draw the human figure over time. And I think that that is true for a lot of people if they open themselves up to figure drawing and they get over the, uh, the frustration you might feel at the beginning in terms of you not being able to draw what you want. Being able to, what's really frustrating is when you start to understand the concepts that an instructor is teaching, but just because you understand the concepts, you still can't do them. That's probably the most frustrating period of time for someone studying figure drawing. But moving beyond that, I really began to uh, to enjoy studying the uh, the human figure and continue to this day. And I think that if you can stick with figure drawing long enough to reach that point, it becomes much easier to learn because then you're just enjoying the process and the learning will come. You keep showing up to class, you keep practicing what you're doing, learning in class, outside of class. And over time you'll see, oh wait, these things that I thought I knew, I didn't really know, but I'm getting a better sense of understanding with them as I go. Sorry, occasionally I have to stop and focus on what I'm doing here because these brushes are capable. The brush I'm using, I've never used this particular brand of brush before, and it is capable of giving me nice thick to thin lines, but the way the amount the way you apply pressure to this brush is different than the brushes I used to use, which I still have laying around, but it's a matter of getting my hand attuned to this new sensitivity. <clears throat> but yes, if you just continue and stick with it, if you're generally enjoying it and you continue to apply what you're learning in those classes, that will help you develop your style because it's not necessarily about finding a style. Um, the one thing that a lot of great artists have in common is no matter what their style is, they have great draftsmanship. And great draftsmanship is just a matter of explaining or conveying form and volume and anatomy. And it can take a lot of different, it can work in a lot of different styles. So it's not a matter of finding your style, it's just learning anatomy and and gesture and structure and proportion. And I say just like I'm minimizing something that in truth, like I said, I've been doing it for decades. <laughs> it takes time to, to get to that point. Pavel also says, um, definitely I think a mentor teacher uh, makes everything easier, speeds up the learning process. Um, says four people watching, make some noise. Ah, Solid spider snake is in the chat. Thanks for showing up, man. Good to see you. You know what? Let me switch this because I realize I have the camera set up so it's showing the drawing with me super big. And I meant to have it the reverse where the drawing is big and I am small. So William, if you're still there, I am curious if you have ever gone to a figure drawing class before and if you have what your experience was and how you feel about it. Um, and I ask this because hopefully I can be encouraging um, I know that when I started taking figure drawing classes, because like I said, I went to a four-year university that, um, that did have figure drawing classes. And while I enjoyed the class, we, you know, we weren't focused on digging into the fundamentals. It was more about trying to find something to say about art and using the, uh, the model posing in front of us as a vehicle for expression. I mean, it almost kind of felt like it was just something that we were supposed to have, so we were doing it. Um, and there were some very good instructors there, but I didn't necessarily know that I could just go to an instructor and say, hey, so I know this is a fine art program, but I'm really more of an illustrator. I need to learn these skills. They could have taught me those skills if I knew enough to ask. But I didn't, and that's also something that's very difficult for young artists is not knowing that you, you know, your teachers know far more. It's not that your teachers are hiding anything from you. It's just that a lot of times there's a lot of politics in uh, in education at a university level, and they just teach whatever the curric approved curriculum is. But if you go to an instructor and say, hey, there's this skill that I don't have that I want, they're happy to, in fact, a lot of times they love it when a student comes to them and says, hey, I'm trying to uh, buck the trend here. I want to learn some stuff that's off the books. And they will, they'll go into detail with you. But, um, but unfortunately, you know, I, I didn't know that. 
And if you are interested in going into some sort of art education, you should definitely know that you can ask instructors to teach you the things that you want to learn. Um, and I also say that with the caveat that art education is a lot more expensive now than it was when I was in school. And even when I was in school, I was on an athletic scholarship. So I probably would not have been able to afford that program if, uh, if it weren't for that. So there are a lot of great places to learn online. Like I mentioned, Carl Ganas has his online, it's called figure drawing school, um, dot com. Let me make sure, let me double check that. Yep, it's figuredrawingschool.com. Um, I am also quite the fan of um, of Bobby Chu's Schoolism. I have not taken a Schoolism class there, but I've watched a lot of his videos and demos. And the only reason why I have not taken any classes is simply having the time. Between my day job and working on my personal art projects, I haven't carved out time to do additional art education or art study. Um, like I said, I'm taking figure drawing classes online and that is, you know, an additional study beyond me just spending time working on my, uh, my comics. But that said, there's a wide variety of topics and subjects and art fundamentals that, uh, that they teach at schoolism as well. And it's one of the ones that I'm looking into when I have more time to take classes. But, um, there's tons of art instructors out there. I mean, Proco, he, you know, not only does he have a ton of great educational material on his channel for free, but my father is not a, uh, well, my father's retired now, but he never worked full time as an artist, although he did train as an artistic background and he trained as an architect. And he was interested in portrait drawing, which I know that's his, you know, it's a personal thing that he really enjoys is drawing. Uh, drawing portraits. So I bought him Proco's online portrait course and he really, really enjoyed it and worked through that. So, you know, Bobby Chu, uh, Bobby Chu Schoolism, Proco's courses, um, Watts Atelier, I think has online courses as well where Proco actually studied from there. So those are, that's another great place to learn online. I mentioned all these places because the cost of an online art of at the cost of a online art education is a fraction of what it would be at a lot of in-person schools. And considering the fact that it is difficult, not impossible, but it's difficult to make a living as an artist, the the cost compared to what the the income you're gonna be making coming out of an art program, I think is way higher than it should be. Um, I mean, the cost of an art education is kind of like the cost almost of going to med school, but you're not going to be making med school money. You're not going to be making doctor money when you come out. So I definitely think that these are, these are options that were not around when I was in, when I was in college. And if they were, who knows, I may not have gone to a four-year university because my day job is actually a graphic design job and I really enjoy it. But it was because I couldn't afford to go to a program that had um, that had an illustration program. I mean, I live in LA where we've got Art Center, Cal Arts, a um, bunch of other great art schools, but that was out of my uh, my price range. Never mind the fact that I had a, a athletic scholarship. That's something that uh, it was kind of an opportunity I couldn't pass up. <clears throat> I really don't like how thick I made this outline here. It's a little bit too bloopy. I'll see if I can clean this up. See, this is the challenge of live streaming while inking. Is sometimes I'm busy talking and I'm not focusing as much. I'll still say it's easier to do this than it is to do a sketch at a, a convention. Like I stopped doing uh, commissions at conventions specifically because it's one thing to talk to people while I'm drawing. It's another thing to be drawing, stop every once in a while, sell a book, sign it, um, give somebody some, uh, you know, give somebody a pitch on what my comics is and tell them what my comics are about. 
repeating that over and over again, flipping through some prints, answering questions, talking with people, doing all of that, it was like impossible to get any drawing done. And whatever I did draw, it's like I said here, like that line being off, you know, it's not something that you guys might notice. It might not even be something that someone who purchased commission would notice. But if every single line was that off, the overall quality of the piece would bother me. The person who is buying it may not even notice. They might say, oh, well, this is still the character I want. It looks cool. But in my mind, I know what it could have been. And that drives me crazy. I didn't want it to be like my worst. Um, I didn't want, you know, work out there to be something that was of a, a quality below what I, I thought it could be. Okay, so I see more folks have uh, have popped into the chat. All right, people are rolling in. Let's see here. <laughs> Solid Snake says, thank you for streaming. Well, I'm, I'm happy to be here. You guys are the reason why I'm here. Uh, William said he never has uh, gone to a figure drawing class. Uh, Doghouse is in the chat. Hey, how you doing, Doghouse? Let's see. Uh, William says, I have an art teacher who pushes me forward. Well, that is good. Um, I, I hope that that's, a, that's an encouraging, positive uh, relationship with, uh, with that instructor. Negro Frazetta is in the chat. Good to see you, bro. Um, Pavel says, what sport did you do in college? I ran track and field. My particular event was the 110-meter uh, high hurdles. So I used to do – pardon me for a second. I, hay fever seems to be a running theme in this live stream. I always have to blow my nose every time I'm doing this. I'm sorry. It's gross. I apologize. It's that. Or I'm going to get snot on the page. Um, but uh, yeah, I ran track and field in college. I did the 110 meter high hurdles. I also used to triple jump. Um, I had a wide variety of events that I did because when I was in a uh, high school, I did long jump, triple jump. Hell, I even did pole vault my freshman and sophomore year. Um, what's interesting is that I, as a sprinter, I was not the fastest. Like I would usually, I'd be on the hundred, um, the the four by four for um, relay or, or the four by one, four by 100 meter relay for those who are not track and field enthusiasts. I'd usually be on that relay, which you tend to be one of the faster guys, but I was not necessarily somebody who was running the, uh, the 100 meter dash most races. I was fast, but not the fastest. However, my body proportions lined up perfectly with the, um, with the height of the hurdle so that while I was not necessarily the fastest sprinter on the team, I could run at full speed at the hurdles, and I really didn't have to change my uh, the pace of my uh, my stride, and that allowed me to be very very good and excel at that event. In fact, I was actually the uh, state champion my uh, my senior year in high school, which I think helped cement me uh, getting my scholarship. But uh, but yeah, so track and field was my jam, and of course, very few art schools. I don't think any art schools have. Um, have athletic programs at all. They certainly don't have any track teams. Although to be honest, when you look at uh, artists, track would probably be the most likely sport as opposed to a football team. You're not gonna have a, a bunch of artists on the uh, playing football. I mean, you could, I mean, I know, look at it this way. In comics, there are a lot of artists who are also jocks. A lot of basketball players, a lot of people who love basketball, get really into it, play regularly. But um, yeah, I don't know necessarily if there would be enough that would be into uh, sports that they would really have uh, sports teams or athletic program. Be an interesting idea for maybe a manga, art school jocks. It'd be funny as like all the jocks in art school because they're the weirdos, they get bullied and picked on. I don't know. Yeah, that, that, that part sounds a little outlandish, but hell it's art it's comics things are supposed to be outlandish i'm gonna come back and look at the chat in a second but drawing long smooth curved lines is one of my challenges and i'm trying to get this line just right
And the big problem here is I haven't developed, maybe it's because I haven't been inking for a while. I used to have the control that I could get a one smooth fluid stroke and get the line that I want. And I don't seem to have that ability anymore. I think the other thing I'm seeing is that the point that this brush is coming to is not necessarily as thin as the point of the other brushes I used to use. Generally speaking, I would ink with, uh, like most of Morningstar was inked using um, Dick Blick Wonder White brushes. They were the, um, the cheap student brushes, but they really held a nice point and I would use them as if they were nibs, where, you know, you, you start using a, a crow quill, and generally over time, it'll kind of lose its flex. And, uh, you know, you may get a certain number of pages out of it before it's like, okay, yeah, this, um, this nib is dead. I would just use cheap brushes. Instead of using expensive ones, I would just use cheap brushes. And uh, when it, its lifespan ran out, I'd be like, well, I only spent like a buck fifty on that brush. So if I get like one issue out of it, that's great. If I only get like, you know, 15 pages out of it, so be it. So I would spend less on brushes, but my overall result was I was pretty happy with it. I would just keep using the brush until the it stopped keep, keeping a, uh, a point. Maybe I'd toss into a jar of brushes I would keep laying around for doing splatter effects. And then just come back to it when I needed it. You know, just move on to a new brush. All right, so. Clean that off a little bit. Let me scroll back up. Ah, my boy Amar is in the chat. Says, hey, Jeremy. Says, sorry, I'm late. I've been on Clubhouse doing art critiques. Dude, I'm going to have to get on Clubhouse. I'm, uh, I'm on there, and uh, I'm going to have to find you and find some of those rooms. I am First off, I'm curious. If Clubhouse is on an audio format, I'm curious what art critiques – how you're doing art critiques on there, whether people are just sharing artwork on the Dropbox and people are discussing it. I am very curious to hear how, uh, how that's going on, on Clubhouse. That sounds actually pretty interesting to me, doing, uh, doing art critiques on there. So yeah, if you don't mind sharing, I would love to hear how, that, uh, how that's happening. That's odd. I'm trying to figure out what, uh, okay. I was trying to figure out what that was. I was causing that little black projection onto the screen. It's. Uh, part of the uh, the stand that the camera's on. Yeah, my, my setup is wonkier than usual, and I'm gonna have to keep working on that. I still have not found a, uh, in all this time, I still have not found a, a setup that works for me. I know that what I should really do, just from doing research, I found that, because even with this setup, I, everything I saw online said I needed more lighting. Problem was, I switched from the, uh, the Logitech camera I had to this older camera. And when I had more light, what actually happened was this, um, all of this line art got super blown out. You couldn't see it. I mean, it still looks like it's pretty good now, but I think part of that is just having the contrast of, uh, having the contrast of more black lines around it. But when I first looked at this, it was almost like too, too much. Let's see, plus it's gonna get hot in here with all this light see I don't know you guys tell me whether it's better with uh, with this extra light or whether and I'm talking about in terms of I'm not really worried about my face I'm talking about being able to see on the screen whether it's better with light on or better with the light off because I prefer it with the light off because that light is actually really distracting and it's too bright for me but I will bear being underneath the baking lights for you guys because you know I'm, I'm here for y'all so let's see. 
Solid Snake says, uh, depends on the environment, maybe. I think we're, we were talking about uh, art schools and, and different uh, programs. So William says, the drawing looks great. Thank you. That's very kind of you to say. Says, do you have any tips for people wanting to make their own comics? Um, and he says, I am back. William also says, light off. Good. Happy to hear it. Um, let's see here. Well, first, William, for your question, yes, not only do I have tips, I have a video. If you go to my homepage and you scroll down past the new videos, the recent uploads, the first playlist that should be there or the first or second playlist should be um, comic creation process. And I found the videos that I've made that walk you through my entire process. I walk you through my, um, my writing process, my thumbnailing process, my layout process, my, um, my lettering process, my, my inking process, my gray toning process. And then I even have some tips on, um, on starting to publish comics. So I pretty much walk you through my, my whole pipeline, my comic creation pipeline there. So definitely when we're done with the live stream, go check that video um, series out. It's, I think it's like seven, seven or eight videos on there. Um, that was something I just recently added. Someone else had asked about, um, they were, someone else, a friend of mine was asking the same thing. He was thinking about getting into comics and he was asking me about my writing. And I realized, oh, well here, let me just send you my, my video on writing because that one is probably my most popular, or one of my most popular videos. And then I realized, wait a minute, he's gonna also wanna know about, you know, every other phase of the step. I, well, basically I said, okay, he's gonna wanna know about probably self-publishing too. So it was a little bit of what we were talking about. This is just a, a personal friend of mine. We were just chatting um, on Facebook. And I realized, oh, wait, I have videos of every single phase of my process. Why not just put together a playlist? It's not even a matter of me having to go and create a program or a course. I can just show you. I've been, believe it or not, I've been on YouTube for over a decade. I think I started my channel in uh, 2009. So you can watch most of Morningstar being created on YouTube. <clears throat> but specifically, if you are, are interested in the, uh, the process of making comics, most of, my, most of my process is documented here. And I boiled that down to the playlist that I felt showed the best and explained the most about each phase of making comics. So definitely check that, uh, that playlist out. Let's see, Negro Frazetta says, Jeremy, I stole your idea of using protectors in a binder for my anatomy studies. Well, good, I am, uh, I'm happy to, uh, to hear that was useful for you. For those wondering what, uh, what he's talking about, I have a thing for, uh, for patrons, that bonus uh, video that I do, we've been doing what I call art book study group. Because we all have art books laying around, you know, whether it's dynamic anatomy, or how to draw comics the Marvel way, um, Bridgman's Constructive Anatomy, Loomis's Figure Drawing for All It's Worth. You know, we've all got art books laying around, but I realized that I have had so many books laying around that I actually have never opened. And I keep wondering, well, why am I not developing as fast as I'd like to? Why don't I know as many things about art and the visual process I'd like to? Why haven't I, why aren't I more of a master? And I'm like, well, duh, because I'm not using the books. I have the tools and I'm not using them. Like if you're trying to farm and you buy yourself a tractor and a hoe and you've got all these seeds and you just leave them in the barn, then no, you ain't gonna have a, you ain't gonna have a farm because you're not doing the work. So Art Book Study Group has been a process of me basically doing the work in front of people, just opening different art books and uh, sitting down and showing how I try to, uh, to study and, and suck the knowledge out of uh, each book. Anyway, one of the things that we were uh, talking about in the art book study group, my most recent video I had, <clears throat> I went through a binder that I have of a bunch of studies from, they're from a variety of art books, but most notably it's uh, George Bridgman's Constructive Anatomy and uh, The Human Machine. Those are two books that I would go through and on an annual basis, I would sit down and basically draw each book. Like I would just open the book, start at page one, and I would copy each page. 
And when I say copy, I don't mean that I am trying to draw an exact replica of each page. What I mean is that I'm looking at the information. What was George Bridgman trying to teach on this page about arms or the pelvis or the construction of the head? And then I would try to get that information down on the page. And the way that that is different is that it's not important whether the drawing exactly looks like Bridgman's drawing. What's important is that when I look at that drawing, do I see the information that Bridgman was putting down? And if the answer is yes, then I consider it a success. If the answer is no, I would usually draw that study again. And I had a whole notebook full of, uh, of drawings of those kinds of studies. And basically an art book study group this past week, instead of studying from a different artist, we just flipped through all of my, uh, my old uh, notebooks. I mean, when I say all of, it's just two notebooks. They're two binders with um, clear plastic protectors. And I would just draw my studies on loose sheets of paper and then uh, if it was a study that I'd like, I would just uh, put it in a, a sleeve and move on to the, uh, the next study. I think I chose doing it that way mainly because there were so many drawings I did that were horrible and I threw away. And that's true. It's another thing. If you people are talking about the learning process, you're going to do a lot of bad drawings. Um, even in this day, like today, like I had figure drawing class yesterday. Um, the class I had was a virtual class in Zoom, drawn on a Saturday, uh, you know, working from the model on a Saturday. And I would say out of the three hour session with the model, I maybe drew like, I mean, it was a lot of five minute poses, two minute poses. I maybe drew somewhere around 20, 20 to 30 drawings. And out of those, I would say maybe two or three were actually good drawings. The rest of them were just, you know, they might have some good sections in them, but a lot was wonky. Some were just, you know, just straight out garbage, just bad drawings. Some were, I was just too slow, like I was just trying to get the gesture right. And all it was was just like maybe a sketchy, loose gesture because I kept working on the, the fundamental parts. It didn't even get to really firm up the drawing. A wide range of it. But um, <clears throat> when you stop looking at bad drawings and getting frustrated and start looking at them as it is part of an ongoing process. The bad drawings, it's not necessarily like that you have to draw you know, a thousand bad drawings to get good drawings. It's that the bad drawings are part of the process. They help you see what you don't understand. And while early on you tend to be, I think artists tend to be insecure about doing bad drawings, but once you learn that the only that that's how you understand what you need to get better at is by seeing the flaws, seeing the crappy drawings. Like, oh, this shows me I don't understand how the knee fits together as well, or I don't understand my proportions are really bad. If they once they show you those things, then you're like, okay, I can sit down with an anatomy book and work on this. If I have an art teacher, I can say I am having this specific problem. Can you show me how to do this better? Um, those are the things that will help you to grow. Um, so I don't look at bad drawings as the enemy. I look at them as a big neon sign saying, this is what you should work on. So they're actually, bad drawings help you get better. They show you what you're doing wrong. You just have to open yourself to that. So let's see. Um, oh, when we were talking about the lighting, Pavel said either will do. Solid Snake said yes. Um, William asks, are there any things you regret when making Morningstar? Um, that's a good question because I tend to try not to, it's not that I try to live without regret. It's not like I'm all YOLO, but everything, much like figure drawing, everything that I do wrong is a learning process. Um, I would say, I don't know if there's anything that I would have done differently if I had the whole series to do over again, I don't know if there's anything I could have done differently. Um, because what I learned was that I have to strike a fine balance in terms of, I do need to use reference, but I don't need to shoot extensive reference. Like there was one issue, issue two 
where I had a friend come over and do a photo shoot with me where he basically posed for most of the characters in this series. Um, he posed as a lot of the different demons. Um, he poses as different cowboys. He brought over his duster and um, cowboy hat. He was in costume and uh, it was useful, but you know, the fact that I spent a lot of time, you know, we spent a whole afternoon doing that. And then out of those, I think I probably maybe used about 30% of what we shot. And I think what I've realized instead is that what I need to do is just draw what I need and get, I, you know, start with what, what I'm, what story I'm telling. And then if I start drawing something that looks weird, that's when I'm like, oh, I need reference for this. So it's not necessarily a matter of I need reference for everything because over the course of – like if you look at my, my past two years of videos, you'll see that I talk a lot about reference and that no one ever really showed me how to properly use reference. So I definitely believe in using reference. Reference is not cheating. Reference definitely helps. But when you're drawing comics, the amount of time it takes to draw comics – It'll take you forever if you use reference for everything. And I think that what I realized is you use reference when you need it. When you try to draw something and it doesn't look right, that's when you need reference. It means you don't really know what the thing looks like. Now, what helps is when you get good enough or you understand your drawings well enough that you can know ahead of time you're going to need reference. And then you can actually shoot reference based on your, your thumbnails and your loose sketches, that'll save you a little bit of time. But even then, you know, I find the best thing for me is to just start drawing and then when something is wrong, to use reference as a way to help fix problems. But that isn't something that I could have, when I, we talk about things I regret or things I would have done differently, that's not something that I knew or I could have planned for back then. It's just something that I had to learn by making comics. Um, I do wish that I had finished this series faster. Um, you know, I also, I'll tell you one thing I do wish I had done differently is for a long time I was doing, I continued to do sketchbooks for each issue because it took me a while to finish. You know, I was finishing at best two issues a year. A lot of times I was only finishing like maybe one issue a year. And so what I would do is when I had conventions, I would um, I would do take my my rough pencils, lettered, and I would get an ash can printed up at Kinko's. That's just like a small, you know, like instead of eight and a half by eleven, it was like five and a half. By, uh, by eight and a half, like just an eight and a half, a sheet of like American uh, letter sized paper folded in half. Um, and I would just make up a small booklet, like a 24 page booklet of the comic. So people could read that, purchase that before the, uh, the actual issue was ready, before it was inked and, and gray toed and all set. And um, eventually I realized that those sketchbooks made at Kinko's cost just as much as if I were to send that to a printer and get just like, 50 or 100 sketchbooks made. So I probably should have just done that regular comic size. So let's see here. Solid Snake mentions uh, Invisible Art um, by Scott McCloud. Oh, um, Understanding Comics, The Invisible Art. Yes, that book is a great book. If that's something that uh, you're looking to getting into uh, making comics, I would recommend that. I'd recommend How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way. Um, I'm sure that there are two or three other books about the comic making process that I could recommend that I'm not thinking about off the top of my head. So if it comes to me, I will, uh, maybe I'll make a video of my, my recommended books for, for comic creators, but I can't think of anything else off the top of my head right now. Solid Snake says, uh, not using tools. Um, <laughs> let's see. Pavel says, I need to go now, but I'll be here next time. Enjoy the rest of the stream, everyone, and take care. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, I hope you have a great weekend, the rest of it, and a great rest of the week. Um, William asks, are there any other comics you'd like to make? Um, I also said bye to Pavel. 
Um, yeah, there are a ton of comics I'd like to make. I have a big folder for writing on my computer, and it's just filled with different uh, different story ideas, different character ideas, um, different series. I have more ideas that I want to tell than I probably will be able to get to in my lifetime. And, you know, I kind of had to make my peace with that because, you know, there's only so many hours in a day. I try to spend as much time as I can making comics and writing comics. But yeah, I'm, I have tons of comic ideas that I want to do. Um, one of the things that I'm doing right now is I'm actually trying to put more time into working on improving as a writer. Because I've spent most of my life working on drawing, working on improving as an artist. And one of the things I learned in working on Morningstar is that I need to put just as much time into improving as a writer as I have into improving as an artist. So one of the things I want to start doing, and I have not done that yet, even though we're already you know, almost halfway through this year, is I told myself I was going to start spending at least a half hour a day writing, just 30 minutes a day um, at the keyboard, working on, it doesn't matter whether it's an outline, dialogue, what have you, but just working on whatever my next comic is going to be. And then when that thing is done, and I feel like it's as written and rewritten as it's going to get, and as good as it can possibly be, and as polished, then I'll just start working on a new story. Because one of the things I found with uh, between – there was probably a, um, a two- or three-year gap between me finishing my first book, Eye of the Gods, and me starting Morningstar. And part of that really was writing and rewriting. And even with Morningstar, I had gotten about halfway through the series, and I realized that there were some structural issues in the writing – that caused me to stop at issue four and probably spend about two and a half months rewriting the second half of the series. And these are things that I had hoped I had already figured out, but it was more of the fact that I was happy with my ending of the story, but I realized that the actions the characters were taking didn't earn that ending. So I had to try and rewrite and put more character depth and explain their motivations and Trying to make all the characters' arcs, their story arcs, feel a little bit more important and inevitable and and beef up their character. But my point is that up till now, my process has been work on a series, finish it, start writing the next series. And I'm going to be doing that again now that Morningstar is done, because it's going to take me a while to write my next series. But I also am somebody who I cannot just start a series, write the first issue, draw it, and then write the next issue. Like some people very much can just make up the comic as they go along. I have tried it, and each time the results have been lackluster. I have not been happy with it. So I really am somebody who needs to write out an entire series. Now, if I were doing like a, you know, a multi-volume like a five volume series, if I were trying to do like Sandman, then no, I would not write out the entire thing. I might outli outline each volume, but I would probably write, you know, each story arc individually. But I tend to think in terms of like graphic novels. I think in terms of this is a story with a beginning, middle and end. And I really like to, I prefer to write out that whole volume before moving to the uh, next project. And I think that once I, I do that for the next series, instead of stopping while I'm drawing that series, I'm just going to keep that writing practice up. So that's one thing I've learned is just to keep writing, much like I need to work every day at my, I, I said that drawing, is for me, it's a muscle that I exercise. You know, it's not a skill that I learn. I have to work at it every day. And I feel that writing is the same for me. So that's one thing that I would probably, if you asked what I would do differently, I would have not stopped writing once I had finished rewriting uh, Morningstar. 
the the second half of it, the second four issues, I would have just started writing the the next project, which would have gotten murky because at the time I was juggling between three different projects trying to decide what I wanted to do next. And I hadn't really made up my mind. But hell, if, you know, over the time that took me to finish the series, I could have written all three of those projects and had each one ready to go. And then it just comes down to which one do I feel like drawing now? So let's see here. SMZ Aaron asks, how do you usually start building the structure out of the story? How do you start building the structure of your story of your comics? Do you flesh them out along the way or do you plan it all out? Well, I plan it all out and I just briefly touched on that. But earlier in the live stream, I mentioned the um, my comic process playlist. On the homepage for my channel, there's a playlist um, after the, the uploaded videos and it's um, my comic book process. And it walks, the very first video in there is my writing process. And it walks you through how I plan everything out. Um, you know, I start with, a, with an outline. I start with a story summary, really. Like just what's the beginning, middle, and end of the story. Once I figure that out, I write an outline, which basically works on terms of what is the action? What happens on each page? Um, and if I think of dialogue along the way, then I, I write that down. Um, really, my dialogue keeps getting revised throughout the entire series of whatever project I'm working on because I'm forced to commit to dialogue when I'm uh, when I'm lettering, and I letter the books before I actually do my uh, my layouts because it helps me keep from making uh, mistakes like putting characters on the wrong side of the page when they're speaking first. You ideally want your characters speaking first on the left side of the page since we read left to right. You kind of want to compose your pages so that the characters are positioned in speaking order. Not always, and there are artists who can pull that off with uh, with great skill, but you don't want to, even though I litter my own books, it's not necessarily, it's not good fashion to uh, to have your, your balloons, the tails of your balloons crossing over or having to make it a, a very complicated, elaborate layout to uh, have the, the lettering come out. But, um, but yeah, the, um, the process that I have is, is shown for writing in that, uh, that first video on writing, and then it goes through each step and the, you know, the step after that. Um, I have to say as a caveat, there are a lot of writers not just in comics, who really prefer to make things up as they go along. And I understand the logic behind that because I've heard people say, well, if the, I don't know where the story's going, then the reader can't guess where the story's going. And they feel like they can get a much more surprising result from that. My, I don't argue with that. I believe in that. I've just tried it and I can't make it work for me. So I'm not telling you that planning everything out is the way to go. It's the way that I have found works best for me and it's the way that I prefer writing. But I, at no point in saying, this is the way you have to do it, it's the right way or it's the only way. Um, I think that there are definitely strengths to making up the story as you go along. I think that there are strengths to, uh, to plotting the whole thing out and knowing what's gonna happen on every page. I think it's up to you as the individual writer to see what works best for you. Um, in fact, the way that I came to being somebody who plans out the entire story was because I tried making it up as I go along multiple times and I was dissatisfied with the writing ele element. And that was when I said, you know what? I need to know what happens. I need to, for me, the way I write is I look at it like a big puzzle piece and I like to lay all of my pieces out and shuffle them around and add characters and remove characters. And if I had just started at the beginning with what I thought, you know, the, the original scene is, I would, it's not just a matter of writing yourself into a corner and having to write yourself out. I would have been stuck with elements that I was not happy with and then have to just finish the story. And some could say, well, you know, the strength of a good writer is you find a way to make the pieces you have resonate and do interesting things and, and make the story work. 
I just, I really prefer the process of, of moving all the pieces around, shuffling it um, around. It's almost like the same way that I like to do a ton of thumbnails until I really figure out what works for me in an illustration. That's how I write. I write the same way that I thumbnail. I just work through a lot of different iterations and variations until I have something that I'm, I'm happy with. So let's see here. I see Ion Rocks is in the chat. Says, "Hey, bro, good to see you. Good to see you hanging out again." And you know, we, we talked a little bit on a we were chatting the other day, texting, and uh, it was good to, to see. You. I forgot to tell you, just hey, it's nice to hear from you again. I didn't actually take the time to say that because we were uh, we were uh, messaging. I was in the middle of uh, doing some other stuff around the house with the wife, but it is good to hear from you, man. And I'm glad you were able to pop in for the chat. William asks. What are your favorite characters in Morningstar? I've never read Morningstar, but it sounds great. Um, you know, if you sign up for my newsletter, you can go in there, and I have a, a free digital sketchbook that I give away that has the rough pencils for the first three issues. So you can read that roughly. Um, but yeah, it's Lucifer's Fall from Heaven told as a Western. And I would probably say... The, the, in the story, there's seven archangels, and they're like the Magnificent Seven, and Lucifer actually begins the story as their leader. He's the uh, the Marshal of Heaven because, you know, Lucifer wasn't created to be evil. He was supposed to be the brightest of all the angels. You know, he's supposed to be perfect. So in the story, it's like how do you go from being the brightest of all the angels to the, uh, the darkest? So Because we all know how Lucifer ends up, but my comic is about the story of how he got there. Now, within that, I tried to make each of the uh, the seven archangels in the the story feel like they had their own arc, and I would probably say out of the uh, out of the archangels, my favorites, my favorite characters are probably Ariel and Gabriel. So Gabriel is actually originally Gabriel was the archangel Gabriel. But I wanted there to be more female characters in the series. So I made Gabriel a woman. And she is a badass. She's kind of like, um, wow. It, it's hard for me to describe. I mean, she's just like, she's got a great sense of humor, but she's very droll and extremely skillful. And she's, honestly, some people might think she's a little bit of a pain in the ass that she's always riding Lucifer. But it's because she knows that something's off about him. And she is always kind of watching him. Like, she's a little bit more critical of him. She's kind of like the only person who sees it coming. And, uh, you know, has her eye on what ends up being the, the downfall of, of Lucifer. Because Michael is kind of like the, the second in command of the Archangels. And Michael is Lucifer's uh, best friend. Let's see. Um, William says, I gotta go. Um, um, enjoy the stream. He said, bye. Thank you for, uh, for stopping in. And I, I hope you will check out the, uh, the next one. Um, let me see. I would say that Gabrielle is probably my, my favorite. Michael, he is a, he's a really good character, but I actually try to make, he's a little bit too much of a goody two shoes. And I think that is actually his, uh, his flaw in that he does not want to believe that Lucifer could be evil. Um, Lucifer is his best friend, his brother. Um, I mean, they all refer to each other as brothers and sisters, but to him, Lucifer really is like he would go through to hell and back for him, literally. Um, and this is the story of their friendship and how at a certain point he can't, you know, he realizes, oh, wait, I can't. I thought I could support anything this person does or defend anything that they do, but he's gone too far and I can't, uh, I can't support this anymore. And it's about kind of the breakup of their friendship. Um, it's a bit of a bromance, but I would say um, the other archangel Ariel, she was someone who, again, another female character who, Originally, I had planned for her to be a love interest for uh, for Lucifer. And I realized that it is bad form to put a female character in a story 
just to be a love interest and give and no other arc to her. Like she, you're not treating her like a, a real person. So as I started fleshing her personally out, personality out, I was trying to think, well, how can I make her fit into the story? And what I did was I took a character that I had originally written to be one of the other archangels. And instead I have him get killed off in the, uh, the first issue spoilers. Um, and what happens is Ariel is his widow. And the, the, the whole thing about the character dying off happens in a flashback because Ariel, Ariel is already an archangel when the, uh, when the series starts. But what happens is she, you know, the, the, demons that they're fighting in this series the whole point of it is that there's these demons that are living on the outskirts of heaven that were created before all of the other archangels they were sort of like the first attempt at creating the angels and they're sort of like these raw monstrous flawed creatures and uh the demons end up killing ariel's husband and she is so angered and enraged and hurt by the loss she ends up demanding to become a uh an archangel like one of the the art because there's like the archangels are they're like you know cowboy sheriff posse types they're you know they're riding around they're defending heaven they're they're fighting these demons you know the rest of the the angels that are in heaven they're just sort of like you know farmers and blacksmiths and you know shopkeepers you know it's like a little western frontier town um, Ariel demands to become one of the archangels and she more than any of the other ones is truly motivated to want to destroy these creatures because they killed her husband, the father of her child. Um, she just wants to destroy these creatures and she ended up like, you know, I thought, okay, she's someone who I was going to put in there as kind of a uh, possible love interest for Lucifer. And over the course of writing her, she she doesn't even end up with Lucifer. I'm not going to tell you what does happen. But she was a character who ended up in me wanting to make her a more fulfilled, well-rounded person. She, she followed her own arc. And I think that's the first time that I, as a writer, experienced what people talk about where characters um, end up deciding they're, they're like you want a character to do one thing and they end up doing something else that's the first time i experienced it in my uh in my comic creating process and it was fascinating to me and i think just experiencing that and experiencing how she grew and changed and what her her arc was was so amazing to me that uh that's probably the reason why she would be my my other favorite um that was a bit long-winded just so you guys can see, I've made quite a bit of progress on the uh, the Doctor Strange here. I still have to go in and fill in all of his actual figure work, but I'm just kind of like doing all of the uh, the the blacks and the uh, the heavy shadow work, and then it's just a matter of coming in and doing the face, the details of the figure. But I'm I'm pretty happy with how this one uh, how this one's been coming out, and it's interesting because when I first started, I was a little bit shaky on it, and um, getting back into inking in general and B trying to get control with a, a new brush kind of challenging, but I'm pretty happy with it. I am going to run through the last couple of comments in the chat here, see if there's anything else that uh, anyone wants me to answer. And then we're going to wrap it up. So we're already a little bit past an hour and, you know, usually we keep the, the streams to an hour. So if you guys have anything else you want to ask, throw it in the chat real quick. And after I get done with a couple of these Kirby crackles, I'm going to come over and uh, take a look, and see if there's anything else to address before we call it a day. You know, I remember now, again, my buddy Carl, um, Carl Altstetter, comic creator, he um, he was one of the guys that pointed out to me that the problem, the thing you have to remember when you're drawing Kirby Crackles is that you're, the dots aren't the energy. It's the, uh, the space between the dots. And I realized that I'm just getting here putting a little bit of dots in there, just dot, dot, dot. And I'm not thinking about 
the energy itself, which is what I should be doing. I'm trying to clean this up a little bit, make it feel more like it's little bits of energy peeking through. Or little bits of darkness peeking through the energy. I'll tell you what I really look forward to is I am trying to make this particular piece careful and cautious and, and make it look as good as I, I know that I can. But I am going through a phase, and I've mentioned this multiple times, where I want to start getting faster. And I think part of that is going to be me just starting to make a bunch of art, like super fast. Almost like speed painting or speed inking. And just letting stuff be wild and chaotic and see where it ends up. I mean, I'm being pretty careful here. That's because I'm trying to correct things that I saw that were going wrong in the beginning of this piece. You know, and that's kind of a challenge um, in terms of making art. It's not necessarily, you know, a lot of times you'll start with a piece and it'll, your sketch will look great and you start drawing it. And you're like, oh, wow, this is really going off. It's not looking as good as I imagined and things are, are wonky. But, you know, I think all pieces go through an ugly phase in the middle and you got to push through that. And sometimes the part of that ugly phase is looking at it and trying to steer the piece back towards what you want it to be or trying to look at the piece and say, all right, well, what can this be? Trying to find the, sometimes giving up what you imagined to try and get to, uh, to something that's uh, giving up the piece you wanted to make in terms of trying to find a, um, find what the piece could be. So let me see, I'm scrolling back up here. Uh, see, Negro Frazetta says, are there any comic book competitions? I know that Hollywood has screenwriting competitions every year. Um, I bet you if you go on, what's the name of that drawing board? Um, Christ, not thought of it in a long time. Um, there's a forum for comic creators um, it's for fighting people to both network with, network with to, to get freelance gigs. Um, I mention it in my video on um, on how to find collaborators. Um, but I, for the life of me, cannot remember the name of the board right now. But yeah, there's a, a drawing board. I'll try if I remember it. I'll post it in the the comments underneath later on. But um, but yeah, there's a, a message board. For, for comic creators, and they probably have competitions on there. Um, I don't know if the Miller World, Miller World Forum is still active now that his work is uh, is owned by uh, by Netflix, but that was definitely a great online community. I bet if you just, honestly, if you just Google comic book competitions, you can probably find some online. Um, comic Book Resources probably has something in their forums. This is one where I would just say Google it. Um, yeah, I couldn't tell you offhand what, uh, combo competitions there are, but I'm sure there's some out there. Um, I mean, hell, what was it? Top Cow used to have their, um, used to have a competition where people would have, um, almost pilot season. That's what it was called. Top Cow had a thing called pilot season and, you know, they'd take like six different, uh, six or eight different entries where people would do like a short story and then the winner of that short story got to do a whole issue or I think they got to do like a whole mini series. Um, I don't know if they're still doing pilot season, but yeah, uh, could I tell you what competitions to check out? No, but are they out there? I am almost certain they are. Let's see. SMZ says um, in terms, that was back to the writing. Uh, process said I've tried that too and it just ended up cornering myself the whole process of just making it up as you go along well if you went through that too and had a um, problem <laughs> had a problem with it then I would definitely say check out uh, my video on the writing process because that's that's what I'm saying I ended up becoming a they call them plotters versus pantsers pantsers being writing by the seat of your pants which sounds very exciting um 
But plotters, actually, it sounds like I'm going to plot everything out. But for me, that's that's how I am. I need to kind of build and plan and structure stuff. So hopefully that, that video will be useful to you. Uh, Amar says, man, I thought your hand was in casts. <laughs> he says, I'm joking. I know you made those. These are just um, cotton white gloves with the fingers cut off so that I um, – so that I don't have to worry. I mean, I'd still worry. I don't want to put my hand directly in wet ink and smear it, but any ink draws fairly quickly. However, I still found that I would get little smudges on there or the oils from my hand would be on the page and then it would make the ink maybe not go on there as well as I'd like. So it's just gloves to help me keep from getting the, uh, just makes my inking a little bit cleaner. So let's see here. Iron Rock says, enjoying as always. And Amar says, are you working on an alt cover or something? Um, no, this is just a, a pinup. <laughs> this is like, um, the most beautiful one, the most powerful one. His vanity and his position went to his head. Um, oh, yeah. Um, yes, Doctor Strange. Yeah, this is just a uh, – it's a commission piece. Of, and I normally don't do commissions, but this one is for, for a close friend of mine. So – um, I know that he loves Dr. Strange, so I'm doing this piece for, for him. And uh, you're going to see me doing a bunch of experimental pinups over the next few – like just to, just to try stuff out. I think that um, – you know, I've said this multiple times. This year is going to be uh, a highly experimental phase of me just trying a bunch of different stuff. One of the pieces I was thinking about doing the other day, I think it's because I found an old box of Lobo comics at my my parents' house. I was visiting my mom for uh, for Mother's Day, and she said, "Yeah, as an extra Mother's Day gift, can you get this crap out of uh, out of uh, the out of the closet?" So I just grabbed a couple of boxes of comics I had there and, and brought them home. And uh, one of those was a bunch of Lobo comics. I thought, "Huh, I think I'd like doing a pinup of Lobo versus Deadpool, just for fun." So I think I may do a, a piece of that next. But uh, let's see. Um, so yeah, I think I may just do a bunch of experimental pinups, just playing with style and trying uh, different stuff. Uh, Amar says, I have not added uh, Seraphim, only Archangels. Oh, in terms of, um, Amar is also doing a comp book that deals with sort of, um, with, with angels and the, the war in heavy. He's doing his own take on it. Um, a series that he has that's available. If you go to Amar's YouTube channel, you can find a, a links over there. Just check out his name and enter that in, in the search. Um, a W A B. You search that or, or Art of Amar. You can find his YouTube channel, and he'll have links on there. Real just his process, but his comic is available also on. Um, why can't I remember anything today? It's not. Is it Tapas? Yes, I believe it's on Tapas. Tapas or Webtoons? I can't remember which. Um, let me know in the chat whether it's on Tapas or Webtoons, because my brain is just fried today. For some reason, I can't remember anything. Um, Amar says, I am using uh, 21 or 22 of the Archangels. Ion Rocks was saying, I was just about to um, say with this piece that it reminded me of Kirby. Yeah, these crackles, these energy things are called Kirby crackles because he was the one who, I mean, maybe somebody else did it, but Kirby is the one who made it famous in terms of these, these energy crackles. Um, and so I thought, well, hell, just throw these in here for this piece too. Um, SMZ says, dude, I'm glad you keep making these. I've seen quite a few of your videos. They've been very helpful. Keep them coming. I most definitely will. I am glad. You know, I'm glad that they're helpful because I like the idea of sharing my process. I don't necessarily think of myself as a teacher because I am still constantly learning, studying. I'm going to figure drawing classes. I'm exploring art books. But I feel that sharing what I'm learning and how I'm learning and, and the, the trials and tribulations, the successes and failures, sharing that process hopefully is educational and useful to you guys. Um, let's see, New Girl says Chan. I'm not sure what that is. Um, it says if the, if the gloves do fit, you must acquit. <laughs> SMZ says plotter sounds like an evil villain. Um, you know, it might be. If I can uh, develop an idea of that, we'll, we'll see where it goes. Maybe there'll be a, the, the, the Plotter King in uh, my next series. Uh, Amar says, yeah, it's the baby version. Uh, nowhere is developed as yours. Yes, uh, he says, it's in Tapas and Webtoons. Yes, okay, so it was both. Um, I was trying to think of whether it was one or the other. But yes, 
definitely check out Amar's ch um, channel. He's got tons of videos on there as well where he shares his process. Um, so guys, definitely check him out. But we are uh, going to wrap things up here. Uh, if I have time to finish this over next week, I, then I'll at least still show you guys the finished process. But if, I may not have time to do any ink work, and it may just be that we'll pick up here next week and continue finishing off this piece. So on that note, thank you, everyone, for uh, for showing up, hanging out, all the great comments and discussions in the, uh, in the chat. It's always fun to have you guys here hanging out. Uh, Joining, joining the process, sharing your, your thoughts with me and your questions, I'm always happy to answer. And again, if you find these videos useful, if you want to support this channel, if you want to get bonus live streams once a month, if you want to see that art book study group and that process that I do, um, you know, there's uh, tons, dozens, I don't want to say hundreds yet, but there may well be over a hundred um, Patreon exclusive video live streams already, but there's, there's tons of live streams for patrons exclusively. Um, you can read all of Morningstar on, Patre on Patreon as well. Uh, it's patreon.com slash G-E-R-I-M-I. And you can sign up for my monthly newsletter, newsletter.jeremy.net. I forgot to mention before, but like I said, free digital sketchbook on there, as well as you get my social media posts delivered to your inbox once a month. Usually a link to one of the uh, recent live streams, a little bit more on what I'm up to. You know, just a little bit of, a little bit more behind the scenes than what you're getting here. And if you'd like to purchase physical copies of my comics, like I said, my standalone graphic novel, I Have the Gods, psychological thriller about a man cursed with visions he cannot control. You can check that out. You can also get I Have the Gods. I mean, I Have the Gods. Morning Star. It's Lucifer's Fall from Heaven, told as a Western, what we've been talking about this whole time. This is volume one. That's issues one through four in there. Volume two will be coming soon. I um, I recently posted the final issue of Morningstar to Patreon, so patrons can check that out. I'm waiting to see if anybody finds any typos. Wait for people to do some proofreading before I send that off to the printer. So that when as soon as that's available, I will uh, I will let you guys know. I'll post that. On, uh, on YouTube, and I'll let you guys know where you can buy the final issue for the people that have been buying the individual issues. And as soon as I have it available in trade, I will also let you guys know. So, everyone, thank you so much. <laughs> I see Clay's in the chat, says, hi, Uncle Jeremy. Good to see you, Clay. Hope you're, uh, you're doing well, hope you're having a good time. Everyone else, have a, uh, a great weekend. That's it for now. Uh, oh, Amar says, next three issues I have written feature Metaron, Ariel, and Azrael. So if you want to see a different take on uh, Archangels, definitely check out Amar's comment. That's it for now. Go be creative. <laughs>